front operations will do leak checks before they depart. Um, and that, and in that sense, we're actually pressurizing the suits and using that nitrox. And that's um, to basically offer another line of defense to the crew members if they're ever in something like a cabin depressurization or something leaking into the atmosphere, you're able to essentially isolate the astronauts inside of those suits from the rest of the cabin atmosphere. So just another layer of safety built in uh, to help keep the, the crew safe on their flight home. So they're still wrapping up the LIO cartridge install and then we'll, we'll start to see the hatches get closed. We'll have the hatch on the Dragon side close first and then uh, the team on board the space station will work to close that A-pass hatch. That's the hatch uh, in node two. You can see actually somebody down. I think that might be Woody Hoberg or Steve Bowen down there right now. They're gonna be closing the, uh, the A-pass hatch uh, on the station side, first they affix what's called a docking target. Um, it's essentially a big piece of metal that looks like a target. If you've ever seen the centerline cameras for docking, you're familiar with uh, it's generally a black target with some white lines on it. Uh, they take it off while the hatch is opened um, just because it basically becomes a, a hazard where you might bump your head into it um, while we're actually docked uh, to the space or to the space station, but uh, once we get ready to undock, they reaffix that docking target, and that's just another piece that's used to help guide spacecraft as they're flying in. So that'll get reaffixed before the A-pass hatch gets closed, and then we'll move into that vestibule depressurization. So that, again, that's opening up a valve on the Dragon hatch that's going to essentially allow that atmosphere to just vent overboard into the vacuum of space. That'll bring the vestibule, that space between the Dragon hatch and the Station hatch, down to vacuum and that'll get us ready uh, for that undocking. And just to recap, our undocking is targeted at right about 1.05 a.m. Central Time at 7.05 GMT. They'll send an undocking command about five minutes before that, so right at the top of the hour. And we do have a window uh, to execute this undocking. We've got about an hour window um, to send that undocking command and still meet our timeline uh, to hit the uh, the descent and the target uh, to come home. Uh, but essentially what happens is they'll send an undocking command and that triggers a couple of different things that have to happen. Uh, there are two umbilicals. There are two umbilicals that are going to uh, retract. They're currently connected right now. They're supplying power and data uh, between Dragon and Station. So Dragon, while it's docked, not only able to utilize Station's atmosphere mixing, uh, but also able to, uh, but also able to uh, draw power from the Station systems and use its communication uh, arrays, antennas uh, for for data and telemetry. So those two umbilicals have to retract. Uh, and back away, and then we have to uh, unhook Dragon. So there are 12 hooks um, that currently hold Dragon in place. They've been in place now for more than 150 days, and those what secure the Dragon spacecraft to that international docking adapter. There are 12 in total. They move in two different sets of six. So after those umbilicals have retracted, they'll start opening uh, the hooks on set number one. Once those first set of hooks are open and the second ones start driving, we are committed to an undocking. Dragon, we copy Lyo configured at 0523. Thanks. And the crew calling down, they've got that Lyo, that lithium hydroxide canister installed. Again, that's what's going to be uh, scrubbing CO2 from the atmosphere uh, of Dragon while it's in free flight. Uh, but again, so we'll send the undocking command, umbilicals retract, and then 12 hooks in two different sets of six. And then as soon as all of those hooks are open, Dragon autonomously executes an undocking burn. This is using the Draco thrusters around uh, the, the service section 
kind of the lower part of the capsule, not on the trunk, but still on the Dragon capsule, uh, firing them for just one and a half seconds, so just a really quick burst, and that's what actually physically separates Dragon from the International Space Station, and that's what we'll call undocking. Uh, they do two burns, pretty much right on top of each other. They do that first one really quickly, and then about a five-second burn following that. And that'll start dragging backing away very slowly, usually just a little over a tenth of a meter per second, uh, backing away from the International Space Station. Uh, and then it sets up to do a series of departure burns. So that's what's going to essentially back it even farther away and then eventually change its trajectory uh, to bring it up and above and eventually behind. And then after one final departure burn, sending it beneath the, uh, the orbit of the space station, allowing it to start to phase in front of it, essentially move in front of it on an orbital path and then send it on its journey home. Right now, though, we are just standing by for the hatch closure with the Lyo canister installed, the lithium hydroxide. That's uh, one of the, the major steps we are waiting for. Um, and then we'll see the crew get the final steps completed and get the, uh, get the hatch closed. Before they do that, they do a, a quick inspection uh, of the vestibule on that international docking adapter again, just to make sure that we don't see any debris, anything like that. Um, and then they'll be ready to to start uh, closing the hatch. And again, we've got two, we've got one in Dragon, one on the station side, that one's called the A-Pass hatch. Uh, and we'll see those close shortly. And here's our look inside. You can see Josh Cassida in the pilot seat, Nicole Mann getting into the commander seat. So your commander and your pilot, they're primed for uh, essentially doing any maneuvers, sending any commands that you need to um, throughout Dragon. Your two mission spe specialists that are flanking them are just helping them monitor. Um, everyone's essentially looking at data um, from the Dragon systems as it's in flight. Um, but if you do any actual manual piloting, that's uh, from your two folks in the middle. Uh, Nicole Mann and Josh Cassida, and that's something they train for. They train through different uh, contingencies and scenarios where um, if anything were to fail or anything not to track, um, they are able to take manual control and do piloting. Uh, but otherwise, Dragon flies completely autonomously. It will essentially do all of its burns to undock and depart. We made an earlier call to SpaceX that the forward hatch is closed. Not sure if you guys copied that. And Dragon, we did not copy that, um, but we copy it now. Dragon Endurance hatch is closed. Uh, we've got a command to send here, and you should see the flight computer state progress to hatch closed uh, imminently. Okay, we'll stand by for that, and then we'll check the PPR, the ISO valve, and just a heads up, it seems like we were out of calm there for probably two minutes or so. Okay, copy, yeah, two to three minute uh, unexpected loss of calm, and, and that was unexpected, we copy. Dragon copy. All right, and from that conversation right there, we heard confirmation that the Dragon Endurance hatch is closed. So that hatch closed coming right at about 11.29 p.m. Central Time, 12.29 p.m. Eastern, getting us one step closer to NASA SpaceX Crew-5 coming on home. So with that hatch closed, we're going to see the A-Pass hatch get closed next. 
and then they're going to open an isolation valve on the dragon hatch side, and that's going to start venting uh, that atmosphere that's currently in the vestibule, that space between dragon and station overboard, bringing it down to vacuum and getting us close to an undocking. We are targeting undock today at 1.05 a.m. Central Time, um, so in just a little over an hour and a half from now. Before we get there, we'll do the vestibule depress, leak checks on the hatch, uh, before we get ready to depart. So 1.05 a.m. Central Time, 2.05 a.m. Eastern, that's 7.05 GMT. We're looking for Dragon to undock. Once we undock, we'll do a series of departure burns, bringing Dragon away from the International Space Station, eventually moving it out beneath and in front of it, getting it ready for the journey home. It's going to be about 19 hours from undock command until splashdown. We're looking at a splashdown tomorrow night, or tonight, depending on where you are, um, at about uh, 8.02 p.m. Central Time, 9.02 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 2.02 in the morning uh, on Sunday for GMT. Uh, but it will be about a 19-hour trip from undocking all the way to splashdown off the coast of Florida for the crew, five astronauts and cosmonaut. While they fly, they'll essentially be in an off-duty phase where um, they'll just be able to get out of their suits uh, just monitor Dragon systems and relax before they essentially take the plunge back through the Earth's atmosphere, splash down where we're going to have recovery teams uh, on a recovery ship, ready to get them out of the water and then get them home pretty quickly. All right, well, with the hatch closed, that's going to wrap up our first piece of coverage for this evening. We are going to be back with you before we get ready to undock. We'll be joined uh, by the team out at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne. We're going to help us take you through the next steps of the journey for Crew-5 to come home. And then as we did on the way uphill, we're going to be with them uh, on our mission audio stream. And you'll be able to listen to the crew all the way. And then we'll be uh, obviously showing you uh, their, de their descent and landing live tomorrow night. So everything proceeding smoothly so far for an undock tonight. We're going to go ahead and sign off for now. We'll be back in just about an hour or so. So tune back in and get ready to say farewell to the space station with Crew 5. For now, we'll sign off. This is Mission Control Houston. NASA celebrates Women's History Month. We are going. The history of this agency is marked with broken barriers, once viewed as impossible. With science fiction turned reality, with innovations that have spun industries all their own, and with demonstrations of peace for all humankind. We soar in the skies of our home planet. We maintain a human presence just outside of gravity, and we touch points all across the solar system and beyond. We're going back to the moon, and this is why. The moon is a treasure trove of science. It holds opportunities for us to make discoveries about our home planet, about our sun, and about our solar system. The wealth of knowledge to be gleaned from the moon will inspire a new generation of thought and action. Without fail, every major program and mission NASA has invested in has led to technologies and capabilities that have shaped our culture. The breakthroughs of the Artemis era will define our generation and the generations to follow. The tens of thousands of jobs associated with propelling us to the moon today are just the beginning of a lunar economy that will see hundreds of thousands of new jobs develop around the world. This is not an ambition of one entity or one country. 
The exploration of the moon is a shared effort. Woven together by a desire for the greater good. Why the moon? Because the missions of tomorrow will be sparked by the accomplishments of the Artemis generation today. Because the ambition to go has already begun. And because Mars is calling. We need to learn what it takes to establish a community on another cosmic shore. So let's camp close before pushing out. And so, we go to the moon now, not as a series of isolated missions, but to build a community on and around the moon capable of proving how to live on other worlds. We'll use the lessons for more than 50 years of peaceful exploration to send a new generation to the lunar surface to stay. We will anchor our efforts on the Lunar South Pole to establish the Artemis Base Camp, positioning us for long-term science and exploration of the lunar surface. We will prove what it takes to assemble a complex ship in deep space. We will perfect the sending down to and returning from a distant surface. We will learn how humans can survive and thrive in a partial gravity environment. With improved spacesuit designs, mobile habitats, and with reconnaissance robots pre-positioning and relocating supplies. We will learn how to utilize the resources we find on these other worlds. Starting with finding water ice and purifying it to drinkable water. And refining that into hydrogen for fuel and oxygen to breathe. We will establish fission power plants on the surface of the moon, capable of supporting a growing community of efforts. And we will expand the logistics supply chain to enable commercial and international partners to resupply and refuel deep space outposts. None of this is simple or easy, but nothing in our history ever has been. The eagle has landed. We got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. This kind of continuous lunar presence is a natural extension of all that we've learned in low Earth orbit. And what we will accomplish there will ensure the monumental missions to Mars are within reach. As we ready the launch of the first Artemis mission, and as commercial companies ready their lunar landers for the first private payload deliveries, we have already begun to take the next step.
More than 50 years ago, NASA's Apollo program sent humans to the moon with less computing power than is in your mobile phone. Since then, technology has transformed space exploration. We've landed rovers on Mars and sent robotic explorers to the outer reaches of our solar system. Now we're ready to send humans into space again. Starting at the place we know best, the moon, where we're going to stay and learn as much as possible as we forge a human path deeper into space than ever before. Artemis is NASA's program to return humans to the moon for long-term exploration. It is named after the Greek goddess, who is Apollo's twin sister. The Artemis missions will take us to the moon's south pole, a region that's rich in natural resources and geologic features that will help us answer fundamental questions about the history of our moon, earth, and solar system. On this season of NASA Explorers, you'll meet the scientists, engineers, technicians, and astronauts of Artemis. These are the people who are designing science investigations, analyzing grains of moon dust in the lab, building tools for lunar exploration, and training to conduct science on the surface of the moon. Yes, so my job title is now astronaut, NASA astronaut. What first interested me and the first time I kind of said that I wanted to be an astronaut, I was around nine years old. I was doing an um, after school curricular uh, program at Judy Resnick Elementary School. And I think I, I asked my parents about who she was and you know what her career path was. And I think that was the first time that it was explained to me that, hey, you know, you, you could go to space and hang out there as a, as a career option. So I think that was kind of the first time I said, that sounds awesome. That's really what I'd like to do. I had had done some kind of, you know, summer program type of classes. One, one thing that sticks out in my head was um, dissecting a cow eye. And I came home and was just raving about how cool that was and it was so fun. And, um, you know, I think my parents looked at me kind of funny, but I think that was, you know, kind of the beginning of my, my interest and love in, in science and, you know, really wanting to, to dive into research and asking questions. Before becoming an astronaut, Dr. Jessica Watkins worked as a planetary geologist. As a member of the science team behind NASA's Curiosity rover, her work focused on Mars. Now, Jessica is working aboard the International Space Station and is one of the Artemis astronauts and rare human beings who may get to leave their footprints on the moon. In that moment, there is a whole team of hundreds of people that have contributed, probably thousands of people, you know, that have contributed to that reality. And, you know, the, the kind of the last piece of it is, you know, the human in the loop that's actually executing it. But in reality, it will just be about representing that the rest of that team well and doing your job, your one piece of that puzzle well. Dr. Julie Mitchell represents another piece of the Artemis puzzle sample processing and storage. When Artemis astronauts deliver the next set of moon samples to Earth, they'll need to be stored in a specifically designed facility and preserved for current and future generations. My main title is the curator of ices and organics. All that means is that I'm helping NASA get ready to bring ice samples back from the solar system. So I work in what's called the Astro Materials Acquisition and Curation Office. We just call it the Curation Office for short. So all of the Apollo moon rocks, meteorites, all of our sample return missions from asteroids, from comets, all of those samples come here to Houston and it's our office's job to take care of those samples and make sure that they're available to the scientific community to study. Uh, so I grew up in Louisiana on the bayou. You know, I was down at the water all the time looking for snakes and turtles and looking at different plants that were out there. Nighttime would come around and, you know, I was just looking at the stars. I wanted to know the constellations. I wanted to understand what was going on up there. And neither of my parents went to college. None of my siblings or I had any expectation of going to college either. My older sister, she actually ended up going to college, eventually got her PhD. She just gave me a hard time and just kind of um, was very persistent with me and saying, look, just apply to one school. 
Luckily I got in, and when I got in, that was kind of the switch that flipped, like, oh, okay, I can actually do this. And I want as many people as possible to know that there are people who are working at NASA who, you know, didn't grow up with a lot of resources and, and have still found a way to, to make a contribution. Okay, so how does a kid that comes from a rough part of Lima it gets interested into science. Of course, I, I was very curious and I was very motivated for science. I, I don't think I would have gotten into science if it wasn't because kind of need that I had for achieving something great. Dr. Jose Aponte works in the Astrobiology Analytical Laboratory at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. He studies grains of dust from meteorites, asteroids, and the moon, hunting for microscopic clues to help answer a gigantic question. Where did the seeds of life come from? Jose could be among the first humans to study samples from the moon's south pole. I read an advertisement that read, we're looking for an astrobiologist to study organic compounds in meteorites. Astrobiologist? What's that? Like, I never heard that word before. I had no clue, honestly. So, read about it and I said, wow, this is pretty cool. Like, Organic compounds in meteorites? Meteorites, okay, that sounds exciting. So when I was a kid, I was probably 10 years old. And every day I had to do the dishes at home. And there was this pot, and this pot had a really thick black layer of burnt rice. Something came to mind and I said, okay, if I wanna clean this pot, I'm gonna add bleach. Because bleach, you know, dissolved of stains and should help. So I add a couple of cups of bleach. Look at it. Nothing happened, of course. So I said, okay, nothing happened. Such a disappointment. I decided to add a cup of muriatic acid that is used to clean toilets. <laughs> and then you know what happens? You know, right? Okay, so when you mix bleach and muriatic acid, chlorine gas is released, but in, in great quantities, a lot of it really fast, really quick. And so I add the muriatic acid and I see a lot of fumes coming out. So I left the pot there and ran upstairs and tell my grandparents, we gotta leave the house because we're gonna die if we don't. When we came back, the pot was all destroyed. I was like, what happened? That was great, that was crazy. I don't know what it was, but that was cool. That's the first time I think that there was a chemist, although I didn't know that I was a chemist at that time. I definitely am a person that doesn't give up. I don't take no for an answer. <laughs> and as soon as I got to school, really I guess the summer after my freshman year, I was applying for anything space related. Uh, unfortunately, I was unsuccessful many times. I counted up and the number that, that I remember from that exercise was about 30 to 35 different applications over a few year period um, of just nothing. And then the second semester of my junior year of college, I was accepted to a NASA internship. And so sure enough, that broke the barrier for me. I got an internship that led to another internship. Now I'm here and get to living out my dream. I wear a lot of different hats uh, here at NASA, but my primary role right now is as the deputy project manager for the Artemis geology tools. That means that along with our project manager, I help to lead a team of people uh, who are building moon tools. And so uh, specifically the tools that are going to take samples of the moon and bring them back to Earth so the scientists uh, can study them for generations to come. I watch the Apollo videos many times and I see the, the video of, of the world reacting to that accomplishment and I just feel so much pride and knowing that I get to be a part of it this time around is just, it's so much fun. It makes every day just seem like a dream. Together, Jessica, Julie, Jose, and Adam are pieces of the Artemis puzzle. Each is a vital component of the team working to accomplish the monumental task of exploring a world beyond Earth. You can't just do this with a geologist or you couldn't just do this with an engineer. You really need a mix of people to think about these challenges from all the different angles. And we have that team. These are our explorers. The people who will get us to the moon, collect moon rocks, deliver them to Earth safely, 
and ensure that we can study them for years to come. By the time we get to the moon, we're gonna have the best tools. We're gonna have the best containers. We're gonna have the best crew. And that's because everybody involved really, really cares. And all of that is gonna lead us to the very best science we can do. Everybody's hard work ahead of time will make sure that we have these excellent samples and that they're preserved for the long term. Virtually everyone on Earth knows the first words uttered from the surface of the moon. That's one small step for man. But not many people know that the next words were all about science. On the next episode of NASA Explorers, Moon Rocks. What mysteries about the origins of our Earth, Moon, and Solar System can we unlock from a rock? So I do remember the first time I held a moon sample. It was in a course at undergraduate level. I remember being in school and a scientist came and, and gave a talk and he actually brought a, a lunar meteorite. And uh, at this point he put a, what we call a thin section, so we could look down the microscope at them. A thin section is actually a piece of rock that's been sliced, about the same thickness as a piece of hair. You can shine light through it and you can look at all the different minerals that are in the rock. So there are actual meteorites that fall on Earth that are made of pieces of the moon. I remember holding this piece of a lunar meteorite. It was, it was pretty small. And I remember thinking, wow, this is so small. We really need more of this. <laughs> I remember that was my number one thought was, we need more of this. We need a lot more. <laughs> I went home and uh, I think I rang every single person I knew. Uh, I, told, I definitely told my family a million times. I don't think they were sick of me, but like they would definitely go away and tell us something different now. But no, they weren't. They were, they were uh, over the moon as me, uh, pun intended. You know. For the past 50 years and counting, generations of scientists like Dr. Natalie Kern have been probing rocks brought back by Apollo astronauts using increasingly sophisticated technologies. We've learned that our moon is so closely related to Earth that the two must have formed from some of the same material. Moon rocks showed the first evidence that the moon has water, and they've even helped in studying the history of the sun, which influenced the evolution of life. I work in the Mid-Atlantic Normal Gas Research Lab, uh, or MNGRL. You know, we're called Moon Girl Lab because we work with uh, lunar samples, but it's actually a, a fun name because we're actually predominantly uh, female scientists that work in there. We are looking at basically the history of lunar samples. And being in this lab, we're basically rock detectives. So we're looking at how old the sample is and what the sample's made of. The reason why we want to answer these questions uh, is because they can tell us a lot about how the, this, not only this sample formed, but also how the moon formed, or what the geological processes are that are occurring on the surface of the moon. So working with the Apollo samples, I, I honestly, I try to take the emotion out of my lab work. It's very humbling. It goes over my head, you know, to have a piece of the moon in my hands. Uh, I study the origins of organic matter in space. Organic matter is what makes up all life on Earth. Dr. Jose Aponte and his colleagues are trying to figure out how the chemical ingredients for life got to Earth and whether they ended up on any other planets or moons. Although there was never life on the moon, it's an important place to study as a record of the events, such as asteroid collisions, that shape the solar system. Rocks on the moon are better preserved and far older than any rocks we found on Earth. My job is integrating science into human spaceflight. So how will we do science on the surface of other planets with astronauts? 
We like to say that the moon is a witness plate for the solar system, and it's it's really true. When you look at our planet here on Earth, you see you know things that we all really like a lot, like vegetation and the oceans and you know cities where people live. But all of these things combined with the fact that our planet is actually very active, just look at plate tectonics, which creates new crust, which destroys old crust. It's again, what drives our planet and the evolution of our planet. These are all things that we're very appreciative of and, and see every day, but they're things that actually obscure the geologic record. When you go to the surface of the moon, however, you have four plus billion years of history preserved on the surface of the moon. By looking at one rock, you can learn a lot, you know, just by using your own two eyes to interrogate a rock and make descriptions about it, you can learn something about how that rock got there, how the landscape around you got there, uh, and you can start to really make broad interpretations about the area around you just by looking at, at literally one rock. Then imagine taking that rock back to a lab, which you can use these really high resolution lab techniques that we have to peer inside the rock, get a look at what you can't see with the naked eye, start to understand how just how old that rock is, how long it's been sitting there on the surface. So it's really exciting to think that this, uh, some small little sample can tell us a lot about different processes that are not just going on from the local region where the sample was picked up, but actually from the whole of the moon as well. By studying just one rock, you can learn about potentially billions of years of solar system history. And so imagine the scientific discoveries that we made with the couple hundred pounds of rocks we brought back from the Apollo missions. During six missions from 1969 to 1972, Apollo astronauts brought back 842 pounds of rocks pebbles, sand, and dust from the moon. Today, those samples are carefully stored in a special facility at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. The same facility will store the rocks to be collected by Artemis astronauts. So I work in what's called the Astro Materials Acquisition and Curation Office. We just call it the Curation Office for short. So all of the Apollo moon rocks, meteorites, all of our sample return missions from asteroids, from comets, all of those samples come here to Houston and it's our office's job to take care of those samples and make sure that they're available to the scientific community to study. The Apollo astronauts all landed near the moon's equator. Samples from there have been instrumental to science, but scientists want to explore other locations on the moon. Otherwise, it would be like landing in the Arizona desert on Earth and assuming that the conditions discovered there reflect those found on the entire planet. Compared with Apollo, Artemis astronauts will carry out a very different mission in a drastically different environment. They will venture to the South Pole, a region that has water ice and could be rich in other resources. The South Pole is a land of extremes. Temperatures there can reach negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. I would actually even say curation starts as soon as the mission starts. So one of the things that I'm talking to the EVA engineers about a lot and the astronauts is how to prepare for when they're gonna go to the moon. For example, we know that we're gonna collect some rocks. What are we going to put, what container are we gonna put those rocks in? Are we gonna put them in a can? Are we gonna put them in a bag? And we need to understand that because for some of these samples, they are very sensitive to whether they're exposed to metal or plastic. And those are design decisions that have to be made years before the mission even flies. They've got to be super strict, the astronauts on the surface. But me, I'd be like, oh, you know, I'd be like a kid in a candy store and just want to, like, I don't know, I want to take everything. And, you know, you can only go a certain amount of time. I'd probably run out of oxygen, me. Like, I'd be walking and forget. It's often said that, you know, exploration is part of human nature, and I definitely agree with that. I mean, even as a small kid, you know, going out in my backyard and, you know, picking up dirt and sticking my hands in the creek and understanding what the little animals and plants were all around me was something that, you know, I didn't have taught to me by that age. It's just something that really comes naturally to, I think, most people. And the same is, is true on a much bigger scale. The, the desire to explore the solar system and learn more about, you know, what we can look up at the, in the night sky and see is, really a fundamental part of human nature. If we want to visit Mars, if we want to explore the solar system, or if we think about going to other planets, we first must learn how to operate on the moon. 
Getting ready to conduct science on the moon and to identify scientifically interesting surface features takes a lot of practice. On the next NASA Explorers, Space School, how is NASA preparing astronauts to think and act like geologists? As an aquanaut, that was just, just an awesome experience, definitely once in a lifetime, to be able to go spend nine days about uh, 60 feet below the, the surface in an underwater habitat. And we would do a, a full end-to-end -end mission scenario, simulating the moon or Mars. That's where we really got to put to the test, what is exploration of these planetary bodies going to look like? So when we have these, what we call aquanauts, living in this underwater habitat, we can simulate some of the conditions that the astronauts will experience. And we're actually able to have these aquanauts conduct EVAs or extravehicular activities, simply put spacewalks, outside of this habitat. So really being able to see that process from multiple different angles, I think will be really beneficial as we start to nail down exactly what that's gonna look like for Artemis. Artemis is taking humans for the first time to the moon's South Pole region. This area of the moon features some of the coldest temperatures in the solar system. Artemis astronauts will look for signs of frozen water and gather clues about the young solar system when the planets and moons were just forming. Flash forward to astronauts exploring the lunar surface with the Artemis program, you know, they're going to be doing exploration. They're going to be visiting a site on the moon that no human being has ever visited before. And they're going to be taking pictures and describing rocks that they see, you know, collecting samples, deploying instruments. And we want to, you know, have them experience all of these things here on Earth, of course, before they fly to the moon. NASA has been training astronauts in geology and geoscience for decades. These scientific fields help us understand the evolution of the physical and chemical makeup of planets and moons. From their deep interiors to their surfaces and atmospheres, Apollo astronauts had hundreds of hours of training in geology, or the equivalent of a master's degree, and Artemis astronauts will too. NASA's astronaut corps includes geologists like astronaut Jessica Watkins, Yes, so my job title is now astronaut, NASA astronaut. We all come into the astronaut office with, you know, a whole, a whole career in the, in the rear view mirror in a lot of senses. For me, the way that I ended up kind of sitting in this seat was by keeping it in the back of my mind. So I became interested in Mars at a pretty young age, actually. Um, I'm not sure, uh, somewhere around fifth grade. So this, is, this was at a defining time for my life. But I remember for some school project, you know, making a little a book about Marty the Martian. That love kind of carried through in college when I found geology because I learned that there's this thing called planetary geology. And the idea of being able to study the surface of another planet was just the coolest thing to me as somebody who, who loved Mars. Geology training on our home planet covers just one aspect of what it would be like to scientifically explore the moon. Lower gravity, extreme temperatures, and a bulky spacesuit make operating tools and collecting rocks a great challenge. NASA scientists and engineers work hard to design and build custom tools that will work well in the extreme environment of the moon's south polar region. Making any sort of hardware that flies in space is a huge team effort. I help to lead a team of people who are building moon tools. And so uh, specifically the tools that are going to take samples of the moon and bring them back to Earth so the scientists can study them for generations to come. At Johnson Space Center, we have what's called the Rock Yard, which is essentially kind of a you know large you know open space where we've imported <laughs> rocks, um, basically a large a human-sized sandbox. It's great. At the Rock Yard, we get 
astronauts to come out to be test subjects, but we also get engineers and scientists and operators to be test subjects as well so that we can fully understand what it's like to be in that crew perspective. So understanding, you know, what what our priorities are, what types of rocks we're interested in and why, but also to start using the tools that we'll be using to collect those samples. Let's just start with the most simple tool, the geology hammer. You, you all know what a hammer looks like, um, but in the South Pole, it's going to be really cold there. And so we need to make sure that we're using a material that doesn't break at very cold temperatures. So we create a test plan that includes putting it through environmental testing. So putting the tools in very hot conditions and very cold conditions and making sure they work. We can't just go to the hardware store and buy a hammer. We have to go make a special one. And then we have testing like ergonomic testing to make sure that it actually works with the astronauts and that it fits their gloved hand when they're in the spacesuit. It's not too exhausting for them. There's all of these little different nuances of being in the spacesuit that are hard to fully appreciate unless you get in there. As anyone who's worn a spacesuit will tell you, it feels like wearing a balloon that's constantly pushing down on you. Spacesuits have to meet many demands. They must be sturdy enough to keep astronauts safe in the low gravity and high radiation environment of the moon, but they also have to be nimble enough to allow astronauts to squeeze, poke, and pound their tools. It's tough to describe, honestly. It's large, it's you know about 300 pounds, I think. You're kind of operating your own personal spacecraft in a lot of ways. You know, the intent is for you to be able to manipulate your arms and legs in a, in a way that you would on the ground. So we have a large pool here um, at the NBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory here on site. In, in the corner, we now have a moon area. So we've um, imported uh, sand and, and rocks down there, and we've started to do run trying to approximate one-sixth gravity. It's a, kind of a lot of moving pieces, but it's, it's really fun. It's one of the coolest things we get to do. And I'll tell you what, some of my most favorite you know, moments at NASA have been when I see these engineers start to get excited about the science that we're doing and start to you know, learn some of the geology terminology, because that really is what creates an effective team. And so hearing, you know, tools engineer Adam Nade start to say, wow, this looks like a basalt that has lots of vesicles with olivine phenocris in it. Just make me incredibly excited because it means that, you know, we're learning to speak each other's languages. There you go. <laughs> I just like to do weird and unique things. So I've always found those you know, those odd hobbies like learning to juggle or learning to beatbox or do improv. I was watching TV and I saw the TV show American Ninja Warrior and I was just like, I want to do that. And so I started to train to be a ninja warrior. That's how I decided that I should be called the Space Ninja. And so I would just share my interest of space. I got selected and got to go out there and compete. So I think we would limit ourselves if we only have one vision of what exploration looks like. Being a part of the NASA team has really showed me what that means and what exploration really looks like on a daily basis. But I do enjoy creative writing, short stories, um, poems sometimes. When I can you know, find the time, it's just a, an enjoyable way for me to explore what I'm thinking and feeling um, and really kind of you know, use the other side of my brain. Now, whenever I take a step back to like think about what I do, I mean, it is just, it is surreal and it is, it's just, it's thrilling and realize that I have a leadership role in this too. And I get to influence what we're gonna do on the moon. For me, I think why it is so important for us as humans to explore is that exploration kind of forces us to push ourselves to the limits of our capacities. I think that's that's really important for us to do so that we can, uh, you know, find those boundaries and push them forward. You know, see what's out there, see what we're made of, see what the, the universe is made of and where we fit into it. The Moon's South Pole is an ideal location for many reasons. One reason is that we've collected more information about this region of the Moon than any other, from a NASA orbiter that's been circling the Moon for more than a decade. On the next episode of NASA Explorers, why the South Pole? What remaining questions do scientists have about the Moon and solar system? And how will going to the South Pole help answer those questions?
imagine if you were an alien who you know was visiting the earth for the first time from some other galaxy imagine only visiting the united states and never visiting any other part of the earth's surface that's essentially what we've done with the apollo missions really been able to do wonderful and groundbreaking science with the samples you know collected during the apollo missions but again we visited only a very small part of the lunar surface the way that i think about it is it's the equivalent of you know, landing on Earth and getting rocks from Kansas. It would give us insight into one particular location on the Earth, but not at all the diversity of what we see on the Earth, what we know is, is present on the Earth. So the ability to go to a different site, a different location, get different samples, will just enrich what we have already learned from our Apollo samples. There's a lot left to be learned about the moon, and it starts with the South Pole. Artemis astronauts will fulfill a different mission in a unique environment. While the Apollo astronauts who visited the moon's surface between 1969 and 1972 landed near the equator, Artemis astronauts will venture to the moon's South Pole region, frigid, rugged, and with unique light and darkness conditions that make it an ideal location for exploration. The South Pole region is also home to the rim of the moon's largest, oldest, and deepest crater, called South Pole Aitken. It takes up almost a quarter of the moon, and is so deep, it exposes portions of the moon's interior. Yeah, the South Pole is, it's fascinating. There are some very unique types of rocks that are at the South Pole that will allow us to understand the entire history, not just of the moon, but potentially of the solar system. Very early on in lunar history, we think that there was this increased period or very intense period of huge material hitting the surface of the moon, creating these really large uh, craters or like giant holes, uh, which we actually call basins. So getting a sample of impact melt from this basin would kind of help us bracket that early period of time. The Moon's South Pole region has resources that are vital for long-term exploration. Because the Moon is barely tilted relative to the Sun, the Sun hovers over the horizon at the South Pole. Imagine a flashlight turned on, laying on a table. That's how the Sun illuminates the South Pole. Light at the South Pole strikes at such a low angle, it brushes only areas of higher elevation, such as crater rims. These locations have sunlight for extended periods of time to harness for power. At the same time, the bottoms of some deep craters are shrouded in constant darkness. Scientists have measured the coldest temperatures in the solar system inside these craters, which have become known as perfect environments for preserving water for eons. Over time, there's individual molecules of water and carbon dioxide and other gases that actually uh, bounce around the surface of the moon and when they get to one of these cold spots they actually get stuck so we call those places cold traps and if you do that for millions and even billions of years you can actually build up a pretty significant deposit of water and other ices from an exploration perspective if we can understand just how much water there is and where it is and how to get it out of the regolith of the moon, we can turn it into really important things like drinking water for astronauts and even rocket fuel to take them back home. So really understanding these resources and how to use them is one of the objectives of the Artemis program and it's what makes the South Pole of the Moon so exciting. We know the moon in incredible detail, thanks in large part to NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO. LRO has been circling the moon since 2009. It's the longest lived spacecraft there. Through tens of thousands of orbits and data from seven instruments, LRO has mapped the moon's temperature, geology, radiation environment, and is providing insight on how the moon is changing over time. LRO is led by Dr. Noah Petro, a planetary geologist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. LRO is this incredible mission. It was launched in 2009 as the opportunity to go back to the moon 
to create this three-dimensional, high-resolution, high-definition atlas of the moon. Where are there safe landing sites for human and robotic explorers? So what LRO is doing is really giving us the, the tools, the material, the data we need to make those missions successful. For many years, LRO's elliptical orbit was closest to the moon during the spacecraft's pass over the South Pole. So scientists have more information about the South Pole region than any other region of the moon. We know that, that we can do more and, and, and build upon the, the legacy of Apollo, but to do that, we needed a higher resolution data set. We wanted to know where the hazards were. We wanted to know where the geologic features were that we want to go explore, and so LRO has created that database. Incidentally, the LRO data volume is now over 1.3 petabytes. It's the largest volume of data that NASA has ever collected from any planetary body. It's remarkable. And what we've done now in support of Artemis, in support of other NASA missions to the moon, is we've created special maps. We share them with the public and we share them with the various engineers and scientists who are gonna help enact and make Artemis a reality. You know, this is basically a Google Maps of the moon taken from pictures from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera. And you can just zoom in and see a five meter boulder on the surface of the moon. That's just crazy. I could spend all day, and I have spent all day, sometimes just browsing around different parts of the moon, just looking up. Air rocks. This wealth of information will make it easier to find ideal locations for a NASA base camp and to quickly identify scientifically interesting areas to visit nearby. So it's my, my real belief that we have an opportunity with Artemis to do something different than Apollo. We build on Apollo, we learn from Apollo, but we, we, we want to expand what Apollo is able to do and build this, this presence on the moon that is more than just three days, more than just six individual missions, but a much larger program that eventually will result in the ability to go on to Mars. Mars is, is quite a bit longer away from our own planet than, of course, the moon is. It, it takes several months in some cases to get to Mars, and it's therefore going to be really critical when we have astronauts walking around on the surface of Mars to be able to stay there for longer periods of time. You've just spent six or so months to get there. You want to really be able to explore the surface around you, and, and having the ability to live off the land and know how to conduct exploration for longer periods of time is going to be critical for Martian exploration, and lessons learned for that sustainable type of exploration start right here at the moon. So there's still so much for us to learn from going back to the moon from a scientific perspective. That it's, it's a, a no-brainer in my head. So with Mars in the horizon as our kind of end goal, this is an important step that for us to take. And then also just kind of from a human aspect, we all have this kind of intrinsic desire to explore. I think it's, it's, it's in all of us and certainly in us as a society. And so I think setting our sights on something and accomplishing this goal together is really important just for international relations, for, you know, just coming together as a human, humankind, you know, the, the human spirit. I think that, that that's a, a piece of what we're doing that we can't ignore as well. I, I have three kids, uh, age 10, 6, and 2. I talk about space often with them. The great thing that my parents did for me was let me find my path. I also look at my daughter and I, I, I think, okay, Amelia, you know, she keeps saying she wants to be a firefighter, an, a construction worker, and an astronaut. And I said, well, Amelia, you can do all three and be an astronaut. Well, I mean, when you're an astronaut, you gotta learn how to fight a fire in space, you gotta learn how to build stuff, so you gotta do all those things. What they'll become, I'm so excited to find out. I have no idea what they're gonna, they're gonna end up gravitating towards. So why is the moon my favorite body to study? Um, I think growing up, you can, you know, you could always see it in the sky. You could see some beautiful stars and maybe Mars or Jupiter as like small little dots, but the moon is just there in all its glory. It's like our nearest and dearest neighbor. And you can even, even with, your, with the naked eye, you could start picking out features on the moon. I think that was really cool, you know. This is thousands of miles away and you can still kind of be a geologist from the ground if you want to. 
And I think that's really cool. And that's why I always wanted to study the moon. Just seeing people walk on the moon, on this foreign planetary body, you know, looking at images like the one uh, behind me here, um, is, I think that always blows my mind. I will say with my, my two-year-old, what I have noticed recently, and this is wonderful, is that when he sees the moon, we're out for a walk, we're driving around, or outside a window, but moon, moon. I and mean, just the fact that he can look up and see, oh, moon, moon. That makes me so happy. March is Women's History Month, and there are women at NASA contributing every day to the success of our current missions and paving the way for future generations to reach for the stars. Mallory Jennings is the first female system manager for the Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or EMU. The EMU is the spacesuit worn by astronauts during a spacewalk outside the International Space Station. Mallory coordinates all the engineering aspects from hardware to new technologies. From communications to thermal protection to oxygen, all the systems work together to protect astronauts from the harsh environment of space. NASA is designing new spacesuits to use for Artemis missions to the moon. Leanna Rodrigues is leading the team using new technologies to develop and build the Exploration EMU spacesuit. She's the inspirational leader who will help our next moonwalkers. They will have more natural mobility and a robust life support system to explore the lunar surface and beyond. Have you ever driven a remote control car? Now, imagine it was on another planet. Vera Alibe is a systems engineer working on our new Mars rover, Perseverance. As the rover moves across the red planet, the systems she worked on make sure the rover knows the direction it's pointed and updates that position for teams back on Earth. She spent last summer testing our new rover's capabilities in a giant sandbox with a replica of the rover. Not only do we study other worlds, we also study Earth, our very own planet. From space, the Landsat program maps Earth's surface to provide information about our resources and environment. Melody Jam is leading the development of an instrument on the newest Landsat spacecraft that will launch this September. That instrument will measure the surface temperatures of our planet. Lola Fatinimbo Age uses satellite data and imagery to study forests. Her research reveals how our ecology has changed over time and works to predict how it might change in the future. Lola is working to make our planet a better place. Erica Alston inspires students through the Space Grant Program. As an engineer, she used our satellite data to focus on air quality and climate change. Now, she expands opportunities for young Americans to understand and participate in our space projects, just like she did. Erica is a role model for future generations. Did you know the skills used to build spacecraft were also used to develop ventilators for COVID-19 patients? Michelle Easter is an expert in mechatronics, which is the design, assembly, and test of mechanisms controlled by electronics. She was part of the team that designed low-cost ventilators in response to the pandemic. Michelle was the first female to join the mechatronics group at our Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Lori Grindle is responsible for flight programs and projects at our Armstrong Flight Research Center. Lori oversees cutting edge aerospace concepts and technologies, including experimental aircraft and unmanned aircraft systems. Flight research and testing is vital in the development of new aircraft. Women's contributions at NASA reach other solar systems. Nicole Cologne's work involves the discovery and characterization of exoplanets. These are planets that orbit around other stars. Using several NASA observatories, she was able to study a puffy exoplanet with low density similar to styrofoam. 
Nicole's work is expanding what we know about the universe. At NASA, women innovate, break barriers, and explore the unknown. The list of their accomplishments is being built upon every single day. This March, take a moment to recognize the contributions of women in the world around us, and together we celebrate Women's History Month. Artemis systems are ready to fly astronauts. A hot fire test of an Artemis rocket engine and educating and inspiring the Artemis generation. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. After extensively reviewing data since last year's successful uncrewed Artemis I flight test around the moon and back, NASA has confirmed initial observations that the agency's Space Launch System rocket, Orion spacecraft, and ground systems are ready to fly astronauts on missions to the moon. The agency plans to do just that on Artemis II by sending an astronaut crew around the moon and back. On March 8th, engineers at our Stennis Space Center conducted this year's third hot fire test in the current test series to certify the redesigned RS-25 rocket engines. Four of the engines will help power our Space Launch System rocket on future Artemis missions to the moon. Second gentleman Douglas Emhoff, NASA astronaut Yvonne Cagle, and NASA Ames Center Director Eugene Tu joined students and their families at an Oakland, California educational event hosted in honor of Women's History Month. The event featured hands-on STEM activities and NASA items to inspire the students to learn about our Artemis program, which will land the first woman and person of color on the moon. NASA's Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer, or ICSPI, captured the light blue color in this new image of a pulsar wind nebula in the constellation Vela. The light blue represents the first ever X-ray polarization data for Vela. The pulsar itself is near the center of the image. Measuring polarization could improve our understanding of how cosmic objects like pulsars accelerate particles to high speeds. I'm Jory. At NASA, we pay tribute to the women in STEM who continue to lead the way for change in our society and culture. This March, we shine a spotlight, just a few, in honor of Women's History Month. Did you know human computers were a huge part of NASA's history? During her 34 years at NASA, Annie Beasley paved the way for women's rights by helping supervisors address issues such as gender, race, and age discrimination. And on the other side of the country, Helen Ling hired women computers who wanted to be engineers, but who didn't have the necessary education. Over the years, more women were trained to be NASA astronauts. While she never went to space, Dr. Patricia Cowings became the first American woman scientist to be trained as a payload specialist and even developed a method to train astronauts on how to combat motion sickness during spaceflight. Did you know a NASA engineer was inspired by a drinking straw to create a new way to clean up toxic waste? Well, it's true. NASA environmental engineer Jackie Quinn was hit by inspiration in the cafeteria when she came up with an invention to clean up contaminated water and soil. All thanks to a drinking straw. Houston, do you copy? In 2001, Ginger Carrick became the first non-astronaut capsule communicator, AKA the person who relays information from mission control to astronauts in space. Four years later, Ginger became NASA's first Hispanic female flight director. From politics to science, pioneers to engineers, women are making history every day. And that is worth celebrating.
You are looking at a live view of the Dragon Endurance spacecraft as we await its departure from the International Space Station so it can make its way back to planet Earth. It's Friday, March 10th here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, and we're expecting the Dragon spacecraft to push away from the ISS at about 11.20 p.m. Pacific time, or about 2.20 a.m. Eastern time. On board will be our Crew-5 astronauts, including NASA's Nicole Mann, Joss Cassida, along with Japan's Koichi Wakata, and Roscosmos' cosmonaut Anna Kikina. The crew is currently suited, and the Dragon and Space Station hatches are sealed in preparation for the upcoming departure opportunity. Thanks for tuning in to watch our live coverage of Crew Dragon, Dragon completing its fifth official long-duration mission for NASA's commercial crew program. Now, for those of you following along, you'll know that the Crew-6 uh, spacecraft just arrived last week and will be taking over on the space station, allowing the Crew-5 crew to come home. My name is Shiva, and I'm a space operations engineer here at SpaceX. Joining me today from NASA Communications is Leah Cheshire. Thanks for having me, Shiva. I'm excited to get to work together tonight. It's always great to be here. And once Dragon departs station, the crew's flight home is expected to last around 19 hours. So upon separation from the International Space Station, where it has called home for almost six months, Dragon will use its Draco engines to thrust away from the station in a series of carefully choreographed maneuvers that we call departure burns, four to be exact. And this will increase the distance between the spacecraft and the space station. Dragon will also execute a phasing burn that will lower its orbit and line the spacecraft up with the landing location. Now, next on the trip home will be its deorbit entry and landing. That'll cover all the operations after that final departure maneuver. That includes the trunk separation, closure of the no nose cone, a deorbit burn, and then deployment of its drogue and main parachutes. Finally, finishing off with splashdown off the Florida coast, at which point our teams will recover Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna. On Saturday evening, March 11th, Dragon is targeted to splash down off the coast of Florida around 9.02 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, that will be followed by the crew getting picked up at sea by one of SpaceX's recovery vessels, currently targeting recovery vessel Shannon. Today on board the space station, we have the Expedition 68 crew led by Roscosmos cosmonaut and space station commander Sergei Prokopiev. Of course, just like the approach to the International Space Station, Dragon's departure and deorbit is designed to be fully autonomous, so that means the action, there shouldn't be any action from the crew members on board. Today, NASA astronaut Steve Bowen, who arrived last week on Crew 6, helped the crew members prepare for departure, and he can watch from the cupola, but the prime departure monitoring role falls on Nicole Mann, our commander in Crew 5, and Josh Cassida, also inside Dragon. The mission control teams in Houston and here in Hawthorne will back them up. To learn a little bit more about how things are going at Johnson Space Center and hear about how the station crew has been preparing to send Crew 5 home and what we can expect from here until Dragon departs, I'm going to toss it to my friend Dan Hewitt. Hey, Leah, and hey, Shiva, great to see you guys. Great to talk with you and welcome everybody inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. It has been an eventful night already as we're getting prepared to have Crew-5 undock from the International Space Station. We did a little bit of a sleep shift, the crew waking up a few hours earlier than normal just to get everything ready to go today. Uh, we've been watching the weather very closely. That's always a watch item we have to have uh, acceptable weather conditions both at our prime site and a backup site and we were able to get those conditions locked in when we did a final uh, weather briefing just about two and a half hours ago 
to get that go for undock. So it was a really big checkpoint to get through. Uh, once we got past that, the crew was woken up and they started stepping through everything to get ready, basically to come home today. They've been moving cargo on board Dragon over the last couple of days uh, as they get ready. And then they also started carrying in all of what's called power cargo. So stuff that needs electricity from Dragon systems to keep it cold during that flight home. That's some of the last stuff that we put inside. They did a couple of other checks, make sure the center of gravity was right. Uh, they installed a LIO cartridge, getting uh, Dragon's carbon dioxide scrubbing system ready. Uh, the crew got suited up. They did four leak checks uh, of their suits. Once they were seated inside Dragon, we had four good leak checks. And then after the hatches were closed, which that happened a little over an hour ago, we were able to get into what's known as vestibule depress. So we've gone through that. The vestibule, that's that space between station and the Dragon spacecraft itself. That's been brought down to just above vacuum. There's almost no atmosphere left between those two hatches. And then after that's completed, we have about a 30 minute timer that goes up. Up, just to make sure we don't see any pressure differentials inside that vestibule, making sure that we're not having any leaks from Dragon or the station side. And after we get through that, we can get into the undocking. So that started a little bit behind schedule. So our undocking time moved about 15 minutes to the right. But good news for us, we actually weren't going to be able to have video of uh, Dragon undocking if we were at a normal time. So this is going to work out great for us. And we're going to be able to see Dragon fly away. So. All of that has been done so far. We're waiting for that vestibule leak check to be completed. Then we start to take Dragon's power systems uh, to internal power. It's been drawing power from station. We also change all of its data from that hardline connection to station over to all of the wireless communications that it's going to use to talk. And then it's time for undock. And so we'll send an undocking command that's targeted to about to go about 15 minutes after the hour right now. And that kicks off a five minute sequence where the umbilicals will retract, the hooks will start to open. Then five minutes later, those thrusters fire and Dragon will separate and start the flight home. So all of that's coming up. We're just waiting to get through this final leak check. They'll do the final go no goes with the team here in Houston and the team out there in Hawthorne and get Dragon ready to start making its trip home. So we're going to keep following along from here. Looking forward to Crew 5 coming home and splashing down off the coast of Florida, off of Tampa tomorrow night. But for now, I'll send it back over to Lee and Shiva out at Hawthorne. Thanks a bunch, Dan. That was a really great overview of the undocking sequence. As Dan had mentioned, separation is set for approximately 11.20 p.m. Pacific time, but the actual undock sequence command will end up getting, be, will be sent around 11.15 p.m. And there's a couple of checks that Dragon goes through. There's hooks that need to be opened, umbilicals that need to be retracted. Uh, those umbilicals provide power to and actually communications to the Dragon spacecraft while it was attached to the station. But of course, when we're leaving, we need to put those things back in the undock configuration. So all that takes about five minutes. Actually, I really love this uh, view that we have inside the capsule. You can see our commander and pilot. And actually, in the back corner on the wall, you can see two of their mission patches uh, from the Crew-3 and the Crew-5 missions. Yes, this is not the first flight for this spacecraft. Uh, this Dragon vehicle is named Endurance. Um, we, you know, it's a, it's a tradition for the crew members, the first crew that gets to fly on a new spacecraft to get to name that spacecraft. So Crew 3 chose the name Endurance for this one. Of course, that sticks even when you get a new crew on it. Um, and uh, Crew 5 is who you see today in the very foreground of the image. That is Nicole Mann. She is the uh, commander for Crew 5, and she is the first Native American woman to uh, live on the space station. So pretty cool right here on the heels of uh, International Women's Day. Yeah. And uh, in sort of the, the background there, uh, but of course not a background member, is our <laughs> pilot, Josh Cassida. Uh, I believe he is a UC Berkeley alum. Is that right? Or am I getting that wrong? Potentially. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure. Um, any case, he is the pilot on the mission. Now, the, the pilot and the commander um, both have displays in front of them. They have the ability to send commands to the Dragon spacecraft. And actually, if they needed to, they could pilot the spacecraft, although you know, fingers crossed that we won't need that today. Um, and they're also wearing their suits right now. Um, we've just gone back to view on the outside of the, the capsule. Um, but they, we heard Dan talking about the suit leak checks that they do earlier on the suits, and the suits are really a, a safety system for the crew. 
Yeah, absolutely. So the suits are custom fitted for each of the crew members. Um, they look pretty comfortable. Um, and before any of these dynamic phases of flight, any of the burns that happen, um, undockings, launches, you want to make sure that the crew is in their suit, that it's secure, that there are no um, leaks. The suit is the way that the crew members are also able to communicate with the ground and with each other. Um, and they also have some airflow in their suits as well to help keep them nice and cool. Yeah, um, the, the suits are uh, also made of fire resistant material. We really have them on board for a uh, fire emergency or if the cabin were to depressurize, then the suits can provide pressurized gases to the crew members and keep them safe while we bring them home. Uh, here's, a, here's a video of the suit. So we've, we've got the, the 3D printed helmet that's custom and the visors. There's an umbilical connection on the right leg and that umbilical connection actually is what provides gas flow to the suits as well as the communication that you were talking about, Leah. Um, and so there's a, an inner bladder layer to the suit and then there's outer layers on the suit. That inner layer is what holds the pressure in the suit should we need it. And then the outer layers are fire resistant material and also of course make them look super cool. We just saw a note pop up on the bottom of the screen that talked about the boots um, and those are able to secure themselves, I guess, kind of click into the footrest. Uh, now the footrest is part of the seat that can be removed. So when the crew is in an extended free flight period, maybe during launch, if they had, uh, you know, a long time from launch to docking, or like we see tonight, you know, they'll have some extended time from undocking to splashdown tomorrow. Uh, they can actually remove those footrests, give themselves a little more room in the capsule. So it's a nice, nice way to open up that space. Yeah, and of course, everything in the capsule has a, a function and a purpose. So you talked about how the suits are custom fitted. We actually have some custom inserts on the seats as well, based on the size of, of each crew member. So they have uh, a good fit in this in the seat. And that's really for those really dynamic phases, like during the launch and during descent, you start to pick up gravitational acceleration on the body, and we want to make sure all those forces are comfortably put away through the seats and not in, in an uncomfortable way that could potentially hurt the crew. Um, so that, along with the seat rests, are actually adjustable, and the, uh, the, there is like a groove on the bottom of the seat that they lock in their seats into. Um, as we actually step into final prep for departure, we may hear a call from the core uh, reminding them about their, their visors and reminding them about their, their seat positioning and restraints ahead of the undock sequence. So right now we have 11 people living on the International Space Station for this past it has been a week, um, and so that is an even more full house than usual. Um, we have had some crew members sleeping in Crew Dragon. Um, it's really important that we're able to space out our crew members. You know, they have their normal crew quarters that our long duration uh, visitors will stay in. Um, crew Five was nice enough to clean those up and turn them over to their new visiting uh, Crew Six arrivals, and um, they they are now reducing this crew size back down to seven. So what we would typically refer to as a full house. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of funny you mentioned uh, the crew members sleeping in Dragon. Dragon does have two windows on the side of the spacecraft that you can see out of. So on previous missions, crew members have actually snapped photos of other Dragons or other visiting vehicles or just great views of planet Earth. Uh, honestly, I'd, I'd be great to have a bedroom with a window view of the planet. That sounds <laughs> I was, amazing. I was just thinking I, it would be very hard at, for me to want to go to sleep if that was my window view. <laughs> now, with, with 11 crew members on board, there's a lot of different cultural diversity. Uh, we have, uh, just on this mission, an astronaut from Japan, uh, a cosmonaut from Russia, of course, two Americans. Um, that, uh, that must make for some pretty interesting conversations and meals and, and just cultural diversity on the station. Yeah, I think so. And just last week, Sultan al Niade arrived as one of the Crew 6 crew members, and he is from the United Arab Emirates. So I know they're very proud to have their first long duration crew member on board. Um, but it is the International Space Station, such a great example of um, peaceful cooperation with all of our crew members. Yeah. OK, so quick timeline check. We are about 15 minutes away from the planned command for undock sequence start. Um, and again, uh, we are, uh, once that command is sent, there'll be about a five minute period where uh, Dragon will perform some final configurations for undocking. So uh, in, in that configuration, we open up the, the hard capture hooks. There are 12 of those around the, the ring of the, uh, 
the docking mechanism, and they hold in the pressure in that vestibule section. Of course, all that is depressurized now. Yeah, so you mentioned there are 12 hooks. Those are released in two sets of six. When Dragon arrives, they are also initiated in those two sets of six. So we'll be watching once that command is sent. Uh, it's also very interesting. Dragon will conduct very short burns to help it depart from the International Space Station instead of um, the springs like we might see on a Russian Soyuz. Yeah. Now, at the moment, Dragon is in this final configuration before undocking. Um, we're waiting for mission operators to conduct their go-no-go -no -go pull. So there's a set of flight rules that all of the folks in mission control are referencing to make sure Dragon is healthy for undocking. And then once that go-no-go -no -go pull is complete, we'll proceed uh, with the, the undocking procedure, uh, of course, assuming that we are go. And keeping our fingers crossed. Uh, but just like during the approach to the space station, Dragon's departure and deorbit is designed to be fully autonomous, so the crew shouldn't have any actions. Um, it's typically faster and easier this time around because the crew won't have to stop at any waypoints like we see when they arrive to the space station. Yeah. Uh, and once the undocking sequence is complete, Dragon does use its Draco engines to thrust away from the station, like you mentioned, Leah. Um, there's a series of maneuvers. We call them departure burns. And for this mission, there'll be four. And they increase the distance between the spacecraft and the space station. From there, Dragon performs a uh, phasing burn, and then that puts it on the right target to get back home for the splashdown location. And uh, just a quick pause to say we did just get a good vestibule leak check, so that means that things are marching forward for our undock today. But wrapping up its trip home tomorrow, March 11th, Dragon will go through the deorbit entry and landing process, or splashdown, I should say. Uh, and that covers all of the operations after the final departure maneuver. That includes trunk separation, closure of the nose cone, a deorbit burn, deployment of the Drogon main parachutes, of course, and finally, splashdown off the Florida coast. Uh, as you heard mentioned earlier, that will be off Tampa, the coast of Tampa, um, at which point teams will recover the Crew-5 astronauts inside Crew Dragon from the water. Now we're looking at a view of Mission Control. So that's Mission Control in Hawthorne, California. Um, and each of those rows are primary controllers, uh, operators, who have uh, a wealth of experience about the various different systems on Dragon, as well as experience about the crew member. We've even got flight surgeons on there, uh, medical doctors who are familiar with the individual needs of the crew members and also their health and safety. Um, that uh, second row from the back has the core and the mission director, as well as the, the SIS-2. There's a number of specialists in there. And the front row in front of that is there's a SIS-1 operator who's responsible for all the, the hooks and avionics and systems. The call that you mentioned earlier was actually from the, the SIS-2 saying, hey, we did our leak check. The leak rates look good, so we're not going to vent any additional gas off of the International Space Station because, of course, we got to bring all the gas up to the space station uh, that, we, that we use. And usually you're one of those voices that we're hearing sometimes. It's one of the <laughs> systems engineers down there. So <laughs> loving having you up here today. But uh, we're expecting that go, no go for undocking in the next few minutes. Um, but I, everything that we're hearing right now sounds like sounds like things are moving along pretty yeah. easily. And again, we are expecting the undock command to be... Station Houston, this ground two for exercise. So just listening to the loops right now. And you can go ahead on to you. Hey, just a friendly reminder, uh, for the end of today, any exercise will be complete by 7.15. Exercise complete by 7.15. And copy, thanks. So that was uh, the voice of our CAPCOM or capsule communicator in Mission Control Houston speaking with the uh, crew members on the space station. Uh, it is Saturday for them, so they are off schedule a little bit today. Um, station and Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop, vestibule leak check nominal. Dragon copy. And that was a call from the core, the crew resources and operations eng uh, engineer here at the Hawthorne Mission Control, letting the crew know that we had a successful leak check, which means we're getting real close to that go-no-go -no -go for the undock sequence. 
One thing I find really interesting is they were reminding them that any exercise that's happening right now on the space station needs to be complete by the time that undock command is sent. We don't want any extra loads or forces being imparted um, during the time that Crew Dragon is preparing to separate or separating from the space station. Um, and that can come from something as small as someone jogging on the treadmill or um, using the advanced resistive exercise device or ARED. Yeah. And the crew member's time on board, uh, well, actually, hang on just a sec. They're having some conversations on the loops about the go, no, go poll. So the mission director has just requested the flight control team to complete their go, no, go poll. So we'll expect that call shortly here. But uh, we were talking a little bit about the exercise on station. The crew member's time on space station is is pretty heavily strict, uh, scripted. Mm -hmm. um, and I also understand that both for health reasons and also just for their uh, emotional well-being, they really value that exercise time. Yeah, and they, they have different uh, exercises that they can complete. Like I mentioned earlier, they do have a treadmill. Um, things are modified a little bit differently on the space station. You do have to buckle in so that when you run, you don't you know run off the treadmill every time. Um, but they exercise approximately two hours a day so that they can maintain their muscle mass and their bone density. Because if you're not using those things in space for a period of six months, you can come home and, and um, not be as in as good of shape as when you left. So yeah. they usually come back pretty healthy and strong thanks to uh, all those studies and, and their exercise. Yeah, and, and actually the transition from microgravity to gravity does cause the fluids in your body to shift a little bit. Um, it also, uh, your your heart actually pumps blood a little bit differently because the, the feedback receptors for your blood pressure expect there to be gravity on your body. So uh, the crew on Crew 5 before splashdown will actually take a few actions to load up on some fluids and wear some special garments to kind of help with that fluid shift uh, and help with adjusting back from microgravity to a gravity environment. Yeah, it's very interesting. A lot of that fluid shifts to your head uh, from your legs, from what I understand. And um, we had Raja Chari on the Crew 6 launch broadcast last week who mentioned that um, even astronauts who don't typically wear glasses are prescribed glasses when they go to space because that, that fluid, from what they believe and understand, uh, can put pressure on your eyeballs and change your vision while in space. Yeah, my, my favorite fun fact about that is uh, it also changes your sense of taste. Yes. So uh, you hear a lot of astronauts saying that they really love hot sauce and spicy food. <laughs> yes, so I've heard that So if you're ever sending a package to space, send some hot sauce. <laughs> this is a live view from inside uh, Dragon Endurance. You've got Nicole Mann, your commander of Crew 5, on the left, and Josh Cassett, a pilot, on the right. You can see they are monitoring the uh, crew displays in front of them. Again, a fully autonomous flight uh, is what we anticipate, but that is where they would be able to take over and take control of the spacecraft if need be. However, things looking good for that undock command to be sent approximately seven minutes from now. This is a really great view of the crew displays. So there are three displays in the Dragon spacecraft. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can actually see the forward view. So they're looking at uh, an imager that's looking at the docking port. And sort of in the upper right corner, they can actually see uh, a representation of which thrusters are firing on the vehicle. In the middle, they've got a set of their procedures. Um, so in this case, uh, it's what we refer to as event details, but it's really the list of events that'll happen as the vehicle transitions through all these states. And then they've got a map of where they are on the world, which also gives them some indication of when burns are upcoming. And then on the right side, it uh, looks like Josh has got a status page up of the vehicle. Um, you can sort of see there's a, a bar there on the left. Uh, if, he would, if we were to get any alerts or cautions on board the vehicle, he'd be able to quickly move from that page and, and address and triage those alerts and see if they have any impact or crew actions associated with them. And speaking of that map of the world, uh, currently the International Space Station is flying 270 statute miles. Uh, just south of Australia. And again, tomorrow we're expecting that splashdown to come just off the coast of Tampa, Florida. And you can see their visors are also still up, so I anticipate that they'll get the call to lower those visors here shortly as we are awaiting that undock command. Yeah, the visors are one of the components that the crew can open or close uh, without 
uh, having an impact on the leak checks that they performed earlier. We uh, ask that they keep all of their gloves and, and, and zippers. Endurance, SpaceX on the big loop. Final reconfigurations for undock complete and nominal. Houston and Hawthorne teams have pulled go for the undock sequence start at 0715 and separation at 0720. When ready, confirm visors down and crew are ready for undock and departure. Dragon copies. Crew, all visors are down. We are ready for undock and departure. We copy. And right on time, uh, they got the call to lower those visors because Dragon is go to undock both from teams here in Hawthorne as well as Mission Control in Houston and the crew reporting that themselves. So now we get to wait for the undocking sequence to begin. And once it happens, it'll take less than five minutes for Dragon to separate from the International Space Station where it has called home for almost six months. Yeah, and the first step in that uh, automatic undocking sequence is for the umbilicals to retract. We've got two umbilicals on the Dragon spacecraft that connect Dragon to the space station, and they provide uh, power from the space station's power system, those big solar arrays, as well as telemetry and a command path between uh, the vehicles while Dragon is docked. And once the umbilicals are detached, then Dragon will unlatch itself from the space station. It'll release what are called uh, 12 hard capture hooks in two separate phases. You might hear that referred to as the gangs of hooks. Um, we need 11 of those 12 hooks to have a good seal on the vestibule, which is that pressurized volume in between uh, the station and Dragon. Of course, that volume is unpressurized right now since we're about to depart. Now, all of that takes about four and a half minutes, and then Dragon will be ready to depart from station and will begin moving itself away using a firing of its Draco thrusters. And like I mentioned earlier, the initial departure uh, for Dragon from the space station looks different than Soyuz because Soyuz relies on springs to push it away from a docking port, whereas we'll see those two short thruster firings to undock. Uh, those are using a combination of the 12 Draco engines around the base of the capsule. The first breaks any stiction between Dragon and the docking port, and the second will slowly back the spacecraft away. So we are expecting the call for the undocking sequence to begin right around 11.15 p.m. Pacific time. So in the next few minutes, uh, we should get that call, but everything checking out so far. We've got all of our crew members suited up in their seats, uh, just monitoring the ride home. Yeah, so those thruster firings are actually pretty helpful as well uh, because they give us a little mini checkout of the propulsion system before we start using it for some of those bigger ver burns. Um, we actually did uh, do a propulsion system checkout uh, ahead of the undocking sequence. So we, we've talked a little bit about the leak checks that happened and we've talked about the vestibule depressurization, but actually over the last few days, there have been a number of checkouts performed to make sure that the comm systems, the propulsion systems, uh, the, the suits, everything in the vehicle is healthy in the correct configuration for undock. So this is kind of that uh, one extra free check we get with the, the Draco firings and it means one less mechanism on the vehicle. Got about two minutes until that undocking command is sent and that sequence begins, those hooks releasing. Um, now, as we mentioned, this is coming about 15 minutes uh, behind when we initially thought we would undock. We've got a series of checks that we go through um, that both teams on the ground and, and the crew, obviously, on the International Space Station, both in Dragon and on the station side, need to make sure everything's checked out before departure. Um, but we have a window for these undockings that will still allow the crew members to splash down at the same time tomorrow. So it's a little bit different. Actually, it's quite a lot different from those instantaneous launch windows that we have. Um, whereas if you do not launch on that exact second, your trajectory is not lined up to meet with the International Space Station. So you get a little more grace when it comes to an undocking. Yeah, and a lot of that has to do with, with the orbital mechanics. Um, when, you're, when you're higher up in orbit, you actually need less thrust to make a bigger change in your, or in your orbit. Uh, there are some Newtonian equations you could go work on to, to figure out why. I'm not going to try to explain it all right now. 
because um, I probably wouldn't do a very good job of it. But it is uh, a function of, of the orbital mechanics. And uh, because of that, while we do try to leave on time, it's more important that we review the data and understand that the vehicle is in a healthy state. And Dragon can actually make up a little bit of, of a delay, uh, or even if we were to depart a little bit early on the undock sequence. There's a, a set of on uh, onboard flight computers. Endurance and station SpaceX on the big loop undock sequence commanded. Dragon copy. So call from the core there that the undock sequence has started. We also heard a call on the loops that the umbilicals have begun to retract. So with Dragon getting ready for the undock sequence, I think it'd probably be a good time to check in with Dan at Mission Control at Johnson. Dan? Hey, thanks, Shiva. Yeah, we can see the umbilicals retracting. They're just about completed. Umbilical demate complete and nominal. I can copy. All right, we heard the confirmation the umbilicals have demated. Again, those provided uh, hardline power and data connections. Those have now detached. The first set of six hooks are now driving. Reminder, we've got two different sets of hooks, uh, each in sets of six, 12 total. After the first set has released, we are committed to an undocking. So that first set six is driving now. And we expect all of this to take another three minutes or so before we get that physical separation when those thrusters on Dragon will fire and begin backing Crew Dragon Endurance away from the space station. So again, umbilicals have retracted. That undocking sequence being commanded right on time at the new time. At about 15 minutes after the hour, the first set of hooks are now driving to release. Following that, the next six will immediately start to disengage. And then once those have separated, the thrusters will fire. We'll get the two quick undocking burns. That first one only being about a second and a half, so just a real quick pulse of those service section Dracos to start backing Dragon away. And then a slightly longer one of about five seconds to increase uh, that rate. But we are on our way right now still a couple of minutes until we get that physical separation, still waiting for that first set of hooks to disengage. But again, a lot already done to get here. The, the station itself uh, still in the attitude control over on the U.S. segment. We've done something called inhibiting DSAT, so essentially no thrusters on the station uh, are able to fire right now. Um, so attitude fully in control of the... First set of hooks open and nominal. Second set of hooks traveling. All right, first set open. Second set opening. We are now committed to an undock, so... Uh, this next set of six are going to open. We should have them open within the next two minutes, and then we'll get physical separation, and we'll call you an undocking time. And we're seeing nominal performance so far on this second set of hooks. Standing by should be within about a minute or so until this second set opens. That'll be all 12 opened, and there will be no physical mechanism still in place holding Dragon to the international docking adapter. We're looking at it attached to the forward port on the station to that uh, docking adapter. As soon as this next set opens within the next minute, Dragon's going to fire a real quick burst, again, about a second and a half to start backing away, and that'll be our physical separation, and that'll be our time of undocking. After that initial undocking burn, we'll do another one lasting about five seconds to keep backing away, and then we'll do a couple of departure burns to eventually bring Dragon uh, out over top of the station, around, and then underneath. But for now, we are... All eyes on those on that last set of hooks holding Dragon in place where it's been for more than 150 days attached to this forward port on the space station. 
standing by for physical separation. All hooks open. All hooks open. Depart burn one has fired Dragon Endurance undocked 262 statute miles over and the Coral Dragon Sea. And Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Separation confirmed. Second copy, we see it. So a successful separation, again, Dragon undocking at 1.20 a.m. Central Time, 2.20 a.m. Eastern Time with Dragon and Station flying 262 statute miles over the Coral Sea off the northeastern coast of Australia. So with that, Dragon now stepping in to Depart these burn Depart zero burns. nominal. Dragon copy. All right, so undock burns completed, that depart burn zero completed. Next one coming up in just a couple of minutes, but with Dragon now flying free, I'm gonna toss it back over to Shiva and Leah at MCCX in Hawthorne to take us through the rest of the flight. Thanks a bunch, Dan. So we had some great shots there of the first depart burn. Uh, we're coming up on depart burn, so that was the depart burn zero, and now we're coming up on depart burn number one. Now this will be a short firing of the Dragon's Draco thrusters. The burn just lasting about 16 seconds. You can see that Dragon has begun to fly away from the space station and these initial depart burns essentially increase the range rate from the station so we can get away from the International Space Station and get out of uh, these various different spheres of control uh, around the vehicle that keep both of the vehicles safe. So we uh, heard a call for successful depart burn zero, that 16 second burn. That increases the speed at which Dragon is flying away from the station. It's gonna start to send it up and over the space station. It'll eventually come uh, down and then behind the space station. Uh, this depart burn zero puts crew Dragon Endurance and Nicole, Josh, Koichi, and Anna on their journey home. So there's a good look at where Depart Burn Zero takes us. We'll also be standing by for Depart Burn One. That's another short burn, about 21 seconds. Uh, that's gonna keep us on that trajectory to go over uh, and then eventually down and behind the International Space Station. Depart Burn One is also going to be what's going to send us out of the keep out sphere. Uh, that is an invisible sphere around the International Space Station. It's a boundary, uh, 200 meters in radius and it helps us determine or helps us um, govern visiting spacecraft arriving or departing the space station. So before moving into that keep out sphere, you have to, ha your spacecraft must be configured so that uh, it would not cross that boundary for at least four orbits, even if for some reason it lost all maneuvering. So we, we monitor that before and after departure. Uh, Crew Dragon continuing to make its way further from the space station. We're continuing to get some really cool views from uh, the International Space Station cameras. So this one's got Dragon, and it looks like one of the robotic arms um, in, in the foreground, Dragon in the background. And uh, of course, the, the opportunity today was a little bit delayed from the initial timing. Um, but as a result, it turned out that we had better communications coverage so we could actually get some of these views from the space station. Now, Leah, I really like your explanation of the, the keypad sphere. I, I kind of analogize it to if you've ever flown uh, into a major airport, there's an air traffic control team who's governing who can come into the airport, what timing they should go do that. And the keypad sphere is, is one of those imaginary constructs that allows the flight control teams uh, of the visiting vehicles as well as the, the flight control team in Johnson to make sure that everyone is safe and no one is inadvertently entering to a place that is habited by people. Yeah, and we have a couple of those boundaries. The keep out sphere is the one closer to the space station and the other is the approach ellipsoid. That one is a um, four kilometer by two kilometer, again, an ellipsoid, it's more 
uh, it's not as much of a sphere. Um, and it is also an imaginary shape, but it also helps us monitor those arrivals and departures of any and all visiting spacecraft. Um, station on the big loop. Station. Duke and crew five, magnificent sunset departure. You guys look great. Great job up here. We're going to miss you. Godspeed. Awesome. Thank you, Frank, and the rest of the crew. We'll be following along. Some kind words exchanged between the crew members. Uh, the uh, they were talking about the big loop. So there, that is the way that we refer to the combined communications between Mission Control and Johnson, the International Space Station, visiting vehicle, so Dragon, and then, uh, of course, controllers here in Hawthorne. Yeah, and we were talking about uh, the approach ellipsoid. So what we're in right now where we're talking on that big loop, this is joint operations. Both mission control teams working together with Crew Dragon, with the space or with the space station. Um, and we are actually coming right up on depart burn one. So that's what's going to take us up and over the station. Um, but yes, it, it must be a little oh, in confirmation that depart burn one has started. Again, this is about a 21 second burn uh, using those service section Draco thrusters. And every once in a while, uh, the thank you, thank you to the ground station uh, or the ground operators on the the Johnson side. They give us some higher Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Depart burn one nominal, and we see Dragon on a nominal trajectory away from station. At this time, you are go to doff suits per procedure four dot oh one two. And finally, I have a reminder that the big loop will be deactivated following Dragon's exit from the approach ellipsoid. And copies and to the teams at NASA and SpaceX, thank you for an incredible expedition that has done your tireless efforts and attention to detail that have helped make this mission successful. I can't tell you how great it feels to be part of such an incredible team. And to the crew on board the International Space Station, you've got it. Make us proud. We'll be following along your mission. And to our friends and family, thank you for following along and being a part of our mission. It has been a privilege to add to the legacy. Semper Fidelis. It is absolutely overwhelming to back away from the International Space Station and gain some perspective on the place we've called home for almost half a year. Station copies, All Duke. Of Duke. Copies, Duke. Are incredibly proud. So a few it's things. It's absolutely overwhelming to be backing away from the International Space Station and gain some perspective on the place we've called home for almost half a year. All of us on Crew 5 are incredibly proud of the work we've accomplished while we were there. And to everyone who had a role in Expedition 68, whether direct or indirect, you should feel the exact same way. We thank you, and we're excited to get back to that beautiful planet of ours and those wonderful people who live on it. Thank you. That was a beautiful view of the uh, space station. I see it. See all the uh, mission control centers all over the world. Thank you very much for your support. It's a privilege and a pleasure to work with all of you at the mission control centers. And uh, it's mission to see a crew, Sergei, Dmitry, Frank, Steve, Woody, Beltran, and Andre, Bon Voyage, and I will be following along. Thank you. Arigato gozaimashita. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone, for everybody, for everyone. Uh, my name is Mike I really hope that you're prepared to to scale them and and give you the land down with the best of all in my life. It's really cool. Thank you very much for everybody. Some words from all all four Crew 5 members uh, giving a final farewell to the International Space Station. 
as... And Dragon Houston on the big loop. Dragon has exited the keep out sphere. We wish you safe travels and looking forward to seeing you back on Earth. I copy. Houston. So we just heard from the Capcom, the capsule communicator uh, in Houston, that Crew Dragon has exited the keep out sphere. That was the imaginary boundary we were talking about just moments ago, 200 meters in radius around the station. One of those safety zones while we are in uh, joint operations that help us uh, monitor any spacecraft arriving or departing. So before moving into the keep out sphere again, that the rule essentially is uh, you, the spacecraft, if it for some reason lost maneuvering capability, it would not cross into that border for at least four orbits. Uh, but of course, departing, uh, we don't have that same that same uh, requirement. They are now well out of the keep out sphere and heading toward the approach ellipsoid. Yeah, and that's part of the reason why we have all of those flight rules and, and the mission control teams there. Each operator is evaluating their systems to ensure that Dragon is safe to enter uh, both the approach Dragon ellipsoid. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to ground for suit storage. Go ahead, Jake. Hey, Josh. I've just got a reminder here six months later to store suits with helmet visors closed. How copy? We got it. Thanks a lot for the reminder. Some uh, friendly words from your friendly neighborhood core. Of course, uh, the crew have been on the space station for about six months. So the little quirks of how do you pack things in the vehicle safely to make sure, in this case, that the visors don't get scratched or damaged, just reminding them to keep them closed in the suit bag. <laughs> they do actually get some training on the space station to kind of remind them about uh, some quirks about the vehicle, actions that they need to take during the undock sequence and the departure sequence. So Josh acknowledging that. Everybody needs a refresher every now and then. And again, we are outside of the keep out sphere. We are standing by for approach ellipsoid exit. That's a four kilometer by two kilometer uh, invisible boundary again. And once we are out of the approach ellipsoid, that ends joint operations. So uh, the International Space Station mission control team will go back into their nominal configuration where they are just monitoring the space station. And the team here in Hawthorne will continue monitoring uh, the return flight of Draken Endurance. Yeah, and one of the key differences with the approach ellipsoid is that vehicles outside of it have to be on what's called a 24 hour free drift safe trajectory. Um, so what that means is if the vehicle had no ability to control its attitude, to control its orbital parameters, it would not be on a trajectory that could potentially interact with the space station for at least 24 hours. That gives time for ground operators on the, the ISS side to consider uh, an adjustment to the ISS's trajectory, but ideally for the visiting vehicle uh, team to work any issues. Dragon SpaceX, we had you five by five on the cabin mic. Good comm check. So call there from Koichi. Uh, we have, uh, have you loud and clear also. Thank you. Now at this phase, because we're outside of uh, depart burn one and on our way out of the approach ellipsoid, we've actually given the go to the crew to doff their suits. So that means taking off their suits. Um, as we talked about a little bit earlier, there's an umbilical that connects the suits to the comm system. But once they're out of that, they actually have to use a cabin mic that's in the cabin. And we always want to maintain communication with the crew in case we need to provide them any urgent instructions or if they need to give us any information. So it's just a, a check there that all the systems are working as they proceed into a more comfortable phase of the, the phasing mission. Now we are continuing to stand by for that approach ellipsoid exit. But if you saw, uh, as 
Dragon was undocking from the International Space Station, uh, the colors shifted on the spacecraft itself, and that's because the International Space Station and Dragon entered in orbital nighttime. So um, they they see a sunrise and a sunset every 45 minutes, which seems pretty inspiring, to be honest. Um, and they even mentioned the beautiful sunset that they got as they were traveling away from the space station. Uh, Dragon is now about 600 meters away from the International Space Station with depart burns zero and one complete as planned and heading toward the approach ellipsoid exit. Now again, it's about a 19 hour ride home for the crew inside Dragon. Uh, hopefully they get a nap in there somewhere, but they won't really be on duty during that time uh, because the spacecraft is an autonomous one. So uh, they, they don't need to take over um, and, and pilot it whatsoever. They are definitely trained to do so, as we've discussed. But uh, if things are moving smoothly, which we anticipate, they should be able to rest and enjoy 19 more hours in space before they are back home sweet home. It might be a little bit of a, a nice change of pace to have some, some off-duty time. Uh, I think I, I heard Dan mention earlier that the crew did have to sleep shift a little bit for this particular undock dock opportunity. We even caught a few views of them sort of resting up while they were in the vehicle waiting for the undock sequence. So during this off-duty period, they'll be free to uh, use the amenities on board Dragon, to have a meal, to just sleep if they want to. And then, of course, as we get closer to the actual entry uh, deorbit and landing sequence, then we will make sure that they have redone their suits, have done their preparation for uh, fluid loading, have confirmed that the cargo is all in a safe configuration for entry, and then they'll get suited up again uh, in their seats for the deorbit burn and entry sequence. Yeah, things are pretty quiet, and from now until then. Um, the, the next, like you said, big milestone, which they'll need to put their suits on for, will be that deorbit burn. Um, that Afterwards, we'll see the nose cone close. Obviously, that was open when we departed station. That's how uh, the crew members ingress and egress the station. Um, they have not used that side hatch in six months. So they'll finally get to uh, open that up once again tomorrow once they're pulled on to Shannon, the ship that is waiting off the coast of Tampa for the splashdown tomorrow night. Yeah, and uh, we, we had some views of it earlier when we were looking at the uh, the camera behind the crew. So if you can imagine in your mind's eye where the uh, center display was, sort of straight past that is the forward hatch. And that's the hatch that they've been using to enter the International Space Station. That's one of the hatches that we closed today. Um, the side hatch was a little bit lower down. The crew don't really interact with that. They can, of course, open it in an emergency. Um, on, on the ground, but the recovery teams will actually do most of the work there so the crew can stay nice and comfortable in their seats. And that also helps with uh, some of the microgravity to gravity adjustment that we had been talking about. So I wanna read off a few of these stats. Uh, for our crew members. Three of these crew members on Crew 5 are first-time flyers, Nicole Mann, Josh Cassida, and Ana Kikina. Uh, and then Koichi Wakata, he actually just completed 500 days in space just a few days ago. He uh, will, by the time of Splashdown tomorrow, have 505 days in space across five different missions. Um, and for the other crew members, they will have logged 157 days in space by the time they splash down tomorrow. Uh, this crew saw f six visiting vehicles arrive and depart. Uh, one of those was a Cargo Dragon SpaceX 26. That brought up some of the solar arrays that some of these crew members installed during some spacewalks earlier this year. Uh, there were uh, two Russian progress resupply ships. Of course, Crew 6 arrival last week on the SpaceX Dragon, um, Soyuz MS-23, and the Northrop Grumman Cygnus vehicle NG-18. So some of those bringing crew, some of them bringing cargo, all welcome sights to our crew members on the space station. They also saw five of those depart, um, including three progress resupply ships, the Crew 4 crew, who they said farewell to about a week after they arrived in the fall, and uh, SpaceX 26, as we mentioned. Yeah, and, and the crew actually do have some role to play on those cargo missions. They, of course, pack and unpack the, the cargo that's in the Cargo Dragon vehicle. So Cargo Dragon being very similar to the Crew Dragon vehicle, but it doesn't have all the same life support systems, it doesn't have the displays, the seats, uh, because the primary thing we're taking up is science and cargo for the International Space Station. The crew actually play a more hands-on role during the approach process, too. They've got procedures where they monitor the approach 
um, sort of if you the the ISS is pretty high up, and so it takes some time for communications and commands that we send from the ground to reach uh, the vehicle. Um, but the crew can actually send direct commands to the vehicle during the approach sequence if they needed to. So those crew were busy during that that uh, approach opportunity and the undocking as well. Oh, and of course, the unloading and the reloading and all of the science experiments that they brought uh, with them. So we're coming up on about 1,000 meters away from the International Space Station. It was just a few minutes ago that we saw Dragon undock right on time around 11.20 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, we are still waiting for it to exit the approach ellipsoid. Those two depart burns, zero and one, they are uh, on the order of 16 and 21 seconds. So um, they really, they really get the spacecraft moving, though. And we anticipate that call to the crew to come just about any moment now that we are outside the approach ellipsoid. I actually just heard some calls on the loops here that we're out of the approach ellipsoid. So we'll probably hear a similar call Dragon from and station the SpaceX core. There it is on the big loop. The vehicle has exited the approach ellipsoid and is on a 24-hour safe free drift trajectory uh, to the Dragon crew. Configure COM for Dragon to ground in preparation for big loop deactivation. So the core, Jake, who uh, we can see in the, the little Station window there. Is safe travels endurance. Indicating to the crew that we've exited the uh, approach ellipsoid. Again, that's that four kilometer by two kilometer by two kilometer ellipse. Sort of the long end is along the direction that the International Space Station is traveling around the, the Earth. We call that the forward direction. Um, so. Uh, core indicating that we're outside of the approach ellipsoid because we're outside of the approach ellipsoid and outside of join ops we're actually going to be deactivating that big loop so this is probably the last time that uh, the crew are going to be talking to the international space station crew on this particular mission i'm sure they'll talk to them when they get back home to planet earth in about uh, 19 hours from now yeah absolutely so since it has exited the approach ellipsoid uh like you mentioned, those joint operations are over. Crew Dragon is going to move into, um, it's, it's the rest period for the crew, essentially, like we talked about. They have doffed their suits. They're able to store those suits. Um, they will, um, like you said, get the chance to sleep. And we are still targeting splashdown tomorrow at 8.02 p.m. Central, 9.02 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, that, I think, about wraps us up. Yeah, they do have a couple more departure burns and they'll have some return burns that adjust their phasing. But now that the NASA astronauts, Nicole Mann, Joss Kashtha, JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Anna Kikina have departed the space station, they, it'll take them about 19 hours to make their way back to planet Earth. They're in the middle of doffing their spacesuits. We actually uh, have them dry the spacesuits, clean, clean it out a little bit uh, in case they got a little bit sweaty or anything inside while they were wearing them. Uh, the splashdown opportunity is targeted off the west coast of Florida near Tampa uh, around 6.02 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow or 9.02 p.m. Eastern time. And that'll be followed by one of our SpaceX recovery vessels approaching the vehicle, doing some safety checks, and then uh, we'll will recover them uh, on board and then bring them out of the capsule so they can start their ride back home. Now, uh, as they rest up on the Dragon spacecraft, our teams on the ground are gonna continue to keep an eye on the weather around uh, the splashdown opportunity uh, to make sure that it is, sta it is safe for that uh, deorbit sequence and then eventually splashdown. And right now the weather is looking fantastic out there. And it 
Well, 9 or 2 p.m. I'm thinking 6 or 2 p.m. here. I thought we might be able to see it, but maybe a little dark over in Florida. <laughs> so even though we're wrapping up coverage here in Hawthorne, uh, the NASA team in Houston is still going to be monitoring the next phases of the Crew-5 mission. So our friends at JSC will provide continuous live audio-only coverage during Crew-5's journey home until we rejoin approximately an hour prior to splashdown tomorrow. And you can find that audio-only link by visiting nasa.gov slash live and clicking the Mission Audio link, or you can search YouTube for NASA Mission Audio Live feed. Now, we will rejoin for live uh, video coverage starting about an hour prior to splashdown. Uh, as always, you can find mission updates on Twitter at, on, uh, excuse me, at NASA and at SpaceX, and of course, at NASA.gov. We want to thank you for watching, and we're going to see you real soon for splashdown.